the reason we want to look at uh, Noah's and the events surrounding Noah's flood is that Jesus Christ uses this record, this epic story, that is probably the most continuous and longest story uh, of its kind in the Bible. <clears throat> uh, he uses this as a warning for the generation that lived just immediately prior to his coming. And that is provides significant motivation. But also in this, God, we learn, is endeavouring to save people. And of course, there's the encouragement. So it is very much a message that can motivate us and also encourage us in these uh, last um, days. There's three and a half chapters dedicated to the events of the story of Noah, of which we read just the first one this evening. And we're going to look at uh, the context of this story and we're going to look at supporting evidence of why we believe it really occurred because up until maybe 100 years ago, it was well accepted um, by, by uh, people in the world and generally the English-speaking world that there should be no doubt. But uh, critics have placed some doubt in the, uh, in the minds of people by suggesting that both in a practical nature the events couldn't happen um, and, uh, and there's plenty written around uh, criticisms of some of uh, you know, the logistics, the size and those kind of things that have happened. But we really do believe as Bible students that these happened and we want to convey not only internal evidence from the Bible this evening, we want to pull out some other evidence that we believe really supports the, uh, the rationale for the, the flood, a global flood of uh, massive proportions that is mentioned here. The context is, as we read in, our, uh, in this Genesis chapter 6, is that God saw the wickedness uh, of man, that it was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the, the stage is set for why the flood happened. So much so um, that mankind persisting in, in behaviours aligned with uh, a lack of appreciation of God in their life, uh, it repented God in verse 7 that he had made them. That is, main, he, he changed his, his, uh, his appreciation of why he had made man. And verse 6, we're told very much at the, at the heart of his, um, uh, of his message is that it grieved him at his very heart and in his being. And so we get the divine perspective of why the flood came about. It was because uh, mankind had um, forgotten their creator and, um, and he was going to then bring this flood on the world of the ungodly, as Jude mentions later in the New Testament. So we want to uh, briefly look this evening, by way of overview, at the flood and Noah's Ark and what really happened uh, according to the Bible. We want to look at some biblical internally ch um, reasons like the, uh, the use um, or the, the mention of Jesus Christ as, a, as a, uh, a person that quoted the Bible and for what reason. Uh, we want to look at some external evidence for the flood occurring, that is things outside of the Bible, independent of the Bible record. And we want to look at the flood as a warning and a promise for today because if it means anything to us, it means this, uh, as Jesus Christ commented, that we are the beneficiaries of, uh, of the message and the warning that can come from that. So where does it fit in the, uh, in the record of things? Just to uh, help us understand where it sits in a position um, of, uh, of our understanding of the Bible's explanation of both the creative works of God so this is uh, approximately 1,656 years uh, as we, we read it, if you read through the, um, the generations there, from the day of creation and approximately 4,363 years until 2019 as we are today. So that, uh, that's where it occurred, approximately 2,000 years after the creative effort. Um, we find um, that uh, God says in Genesis 6 verse 3, at a point in time, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. And of course, a, prophet, a prophetic timeline was given. God says at the beginning of that period, 
I will destroy man whom I have created in verse 7 of Genesis chapter 6 from the face of the earth, man, beast, creeping things and the fowls of the air. And of course, uh, as we go on in this chapter in verse 13, God commands Noah and says, uh, the earth is filled with violence, behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So that's an approximate timeline. And this, uh, in, this 120 years that, um, that Noah had to prepare the ark, a wooden structure, uh, to preserve mankind and, uh, and beast for the, the period of um, uh, the, the flooding of the earth, which took just over one year. So what was the ark? Well, we read the dimensions there, but it was in a very different um, style of measurement that we use today. It was measured in uh, cubits. Sorry about that. Let's just go back. Um, so we have uh, 50 cubits wide, 300 cubits long, and uh, 30 cubits high. So translating that into um, modern day measurements of length of about 133 metres, from where I stand now, about down to the lights on the edge of uh, Grand Junction Road, breadth of about 22 metres, so double, slightly double the width of this hall, maybe three times the width of this hall, Height of about 13 metres, well, it's about three and a half metres here, so it was about uh, three, three times the height of the internal part of this hall. And we're told that it had three decks uh, with a total volume of 40,000 cubic metres and a tonnage estimated by uh, maritime builders of about 120 tonnes. In fact, there's um, several people that have created replicas. I know of three. There's a small one in Israel. This one's in the Netherlands. Uh, and, of course, there's a recently opened one in, um, in Kentucky where, um, where some uh, creationists, some people who firmly be in, uh, in, in the, the role of creation in the Genesis record, have gone about to build a structure to educate people in, uh, in the size and uh, you know, appreciate what that's all about. Uh, how does it compare? Well, or here's, here's some of the things we read about in Genesis chapter 6. There's a... Uh, first, second and third, which suggested that potentially bird storage could go in the top, food storage in the second and animal storage on the bottom. That's by no means uh, a biblical uh, statement. It's just uh, an estimate of what might have happened in the, uh, in the thing. And uh, pe people have done uh, significant calculations around this to understand that species could be preserved uh, quite safely in, in an arc of that nature. It's no mean feat. It stands today as uh, the biggest wooden structure uh, ever built. So um, obviously ships that are made of steel are, are a lot bigger. And so, for instance, to compare it with uh, some of the, the ships we might know, uh, there's um, the Titanic, for instance, and the Queen Mary compared to just over 500 feet length of Noah's Ark. So uh, no, um, no uh, average size uh, boat. It's uh, a, a, an incredible... Um, um, uh, piece of equipment, and uh, and it is understood that it forms the proportion of those other bo boats. That is, the length, height, and depth forms a consistent proportion to what maritime engineers have uh, worked out today as the ultimate floating vessel. And so you may see pictures of cargo ships and that kind of thing. They form an approximate uh, um, uh, comparison in size and shape to Noah's Ark. So. It was built for stability, it was not built for speed, it was built for floatability and supporting the, uh, the animals and the people uh, through the period of the, the flood as we know it and as recorded in Genesis. So, what, it, uh, what actually happened? Well, we read, but just to quickly um, cap uh, over what we did, from the Genesis record, around about 2500 BC, or 1600 years after creation, um, where we found, as recorded in Genesis, that the world was divided into two very distinct groups, a group of people who we would call the ungodly, as called in Genesis, where um, uh, those that didn't revere God but went about their own ways and, uh, and pursued their own things, increasingly filling the world with violence till a point that God was grieved at his heart. 
And then there was another group, the godly, a just man he's described as in, um, uh, in, in Genesis 6 verse 9, who walked with God. So uh, very different um, groups. <clears throat> and God obviously decided to intervene. He spoke with Noah and said, uh, create me this ark and uh, gather male and female of every kind of bird uh, because a flood was coming as we read in uh, Genesis 6. So that's very briefly what the, um, what the impact of the flood was. And here we go through the remainder of the story that we didn't read this, after, uh, this evening, but going on through Genesis 7 and 8, Noah and his family uh, embarked in the ark and then this phenomena happened um, the, the fountains of the earth, that is the underground reservoirs, were broken up uh, and releasing water from below, below them and also above them. Uh, in Genesis 8 verse 2, the, the heavens opened as well. Um, and, and of course this continued for approximately um, 40 days and 40 nights continuously. Now we've had a little bit of rain in Adelaide over the last three months, but not continuously. And of course, this combined event where both the uh, substrate of the earth was broken apart and the subterranean waters um, came out, along with the rain that dropped from heaven, uh, caused the catastrophe of the flood, causing the waters to, um, to uh, rise, uh, as we read in, uh, or as we find in Genesis chapter 7, that the waters prevailed and uh, it, to the point in verse 20 where they went 15 cubits upward, so using our measurements, uh, about seven metres above uh, the highest mountain on the earth. Um, <clears throat> anything or anyone not in the ark perished, we read in Genesis 7, and then it took 150 days for the waters to recede. The site we now know, uh, sorry, the sites we now know that should read that we now know as ocean rivers and lakes. So the waters receded uh, and, um, and left the world in the condition that we have it today. Noah and his family and the animals came out of the ark unharmed uh, and therefore were saved. And then God promised in chapter 8 that he would never do that again. So that's another part, another aspect of the of the flood record that often gets missed in people's criticism is that the rainbow becomes a testimony to the fact that God would never um, flood the world again. And of course, um, that has never happened. Uh, so that, that is a very brief summary of the events that happened. Um, and, and of course, the Genesis record has come under some criticism because of some of those facts. Tonight we want to look at evidence for the flood and uh, particularly um, some of the cross-cultural historical testimony. So this is where the flood was recorded in other nations not related specifically to the Middle East or the Bible record. Uh, we want to have a look at the fossil record and um, that's a, a very interesting uh, study that um, obviously we've got to be careful on what conclusions we come to. But we also want to look at stratas or layers in the Earth's surface because obviously an, an event of this magnitude is going to have significant impact on uh, what happened. And in fact, the, uh, the other slide there, possibly the tectonic plates and the movement of tectonic plates happened at, at this point in time when the waters broke up. We also want to have a look at polystrate fossil, uh, fossils. And uh, don't be too worried about that. We'll explain that when we come a little bit uh, nearer to that. So it uh, sounds confusing, but it won't be when we get there. So here's, uh, you know, some of the evidence that uh, it is external to the Bible. This is what we might call cross-cultural historical testimony. That is, things that have happened outside of the biblical record, but noted in uh, tablets and uh, records from other people across the, the, the face of the earth uh, in regard to the events specifically in uh, Genesis chapter 6. So, for instance, um, in most of the stories, and I'll blow that up for you a little bit so that you can see it just a little bit better, um, there is a record of things like, uh, you know, um, the, the uh, divine destruction. Predominantly in that list, 
you will see that the ark is provided as a, as a mode of transport, is mentioned in most of those cultures. And those cultures come from a, a global um, sort of area, Central Asia, South America, Russia, the Middle East, and some uh, Pacific Islands even. So uh, these traditions that have been passed down through time uh, testify to some extent as to the, uh, to the events of uh, Genesis chapter 6 as recorded in our Bible this evening. Uh, a universal devastation by water is mentioned uh, without, uh, in, in, all of those, uh, in all of those areas. <clears throat> and so uh, that's a rather interesting um, conclusion to come to, is that people have talked and written and collected material about the flood independent of our reading of the Bible this evening and the preservation of God's word through history. Uh, so that makes a, a very interesting study. Um, and I would encourage you to go and look at that um, from those uh, areas that we talk about there. So uh, what about some of the uh, evidence of, of fossil record? And we'll have to move reasonably quickly through, through this material, so I apologise. The, um, the presentation will be made available to you afterwards if you want to go uh, back over this, but so we'll have to keep moving. <coughs> so evidence from the fossil record, of course... Um, uh, fossil evidence is consistent with a massive worldwide flood of significant depth. Um, just to, to take us back to school for a little bit, a fossil is a, na a noun, it's a naming word. Uh, it means the remains or impression of a plant or animal preserved in petrified form. Petra, obviously, rock is the Greek word rock. Uh, as a mould or cast in rock, and that comes from uh, an, an English dictionary. Typically, fossils are preserved by what we might call a method called sudden burial or being snap frozen. The, the frozen probably implies the wrong word there, but in actual fact, um, what we want to convey there is the immediacy of the conversion from a living being to, a, um, to, a, uh, you know, to an image in, in very, very strong rock. So... There's no evidence of natural decay in some of these fossils. That means when it happens, it's not as though the rock forms around it, almost like pouring a mould over a, uh, a decaying element would create a very, very uh, messed up uh, fossil. In actual fact, the fossils that we're going to have a look at are very, very clear and would suggest that they happened immediately, which is very different to some of the things that have been presented uh, by scientists about the slow growth and development of fossils uh, in their, in, you know, as they've been preserved. So some of the things supporting that is that there's no evidence of natural decay in the actual fossil itself. There's no damage by the elements, so it's not as though they've been exposed to, you know, the normal seasonal adjustments if it was over many years. Um, and it, it's highly abnormal to see these kind of patterns replicated into things as hard as rock. It's not, uh, not easy to replicate that, uh, even if you tried to um, you know, carve it or something like that. So, so the fossil record becomes quite a credible evidentiary tool uh, when it comes to understanding the impact of something like a global flood. Uh, there are, in certain areas of the world, what they call fossil graveyards. You'll hear about... Um, you know, fossil digs that are, you know, particularly in Mexico and, and other areas that are, there's billions of fossils together. So the calamity of the events that we've read about are more likely to have occurred where, um, because of these, these fossils are all together. And then there's this uh, highly, um, you know, interesting anomaly that fossils have been found, uh, or underwater creatures, have been found on places like Mount Everest. And, of course, that anomaly is, is uh, hard to understand uh, if we just accept that, um, you know, the, the, the world has been there for billions of years in its current form. We'll have a look more at that. So here's some of the evidence that, uh, that the scientific world provides us with in, re in regard to the fossils. Now, there's, there's a um, small um, dinosaur fossil. It was obviously covered very, very quickly by a massive amount of either mud or seawater and, and captured in its, uh, in its state, in full life state there. 
Uh, on the right is a sea fossil found in the middle of the Sahara Desert. So uh, one of those anomalies, um, you know, sea life hasn't been in the Sahara for, for many millennia. And, uh, and of course they've found these fossils in remote places where, where otherwise they could only have been the, the creation of a worldwide flood. Um, layers do not form as it states there under, uh, except under catastrophic circumstances where there's high volumes of material, animals caught uh, while they're in process of either fleeing or running and, uh, and captured and almost like they were snapped frozen. Uh, so that requires a massive, sudden and very, very quick change in, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the in the world. So uh, we believe that's supportive of what we've seen. Uh, here's one of, I think, the best uh, fossils that illustrates the nature of the sudden and immediate and instantaneous change from a living, moving being, life-filled um, animal to being encased in rock and immobile. It's the fossil of a fish swallowing another fish. So it's a predatory fish that is uh, eating, halfway through eating another fish when, when it was captured in that. And of course, that would tell us that, um, that it must have been an incredibly uh, quick uh, uh, and change uh, for this animal to be preserved in rock uh, in, in a moment while it's feeding. So I think that is one of the, the best proofs of, um, of the sudden and immediate impact. And of course, the other one we've mentioned, sediments containing fossils formed at sea level are now nearly nine kilometres above sea level, uh, somewhere in the, in the um, remoteness of Mount Everest. Another uh, very, um, uh, very interesting fossil is, is the, um, what's called the uh, silicanths. It's uh, pronounced slightly different to how it appears on the screen there, but silicanths uh, were thought to have um, been uh, extinct about 66 million years ago, the late Cretaceous period, if you're interested in uh, periods of time used by scientists. Um, they had a unique shape. Uh, they only had been observed in fossil forms and therefore were used as proof of an unknown species, species from a very long time, related somehow to a lungfish uh, because of their anatomy. However, they, had, uh, they were not thought to be in existence and this fossil was, uh, w was pronounced to be um, you know, one of the transition points in, in the evolution theory. <clears throat> and of course... Um, you know, that was all very well until in 1938 when a, um, um, a zoologist was walking along the beach of South Africa and amidst the catch of a local fisherman was a silicanth, exactly the same shape, un, um, unchanged in shape from, from these kind of uh, fossils that were, that were seen there. In actual fact, you can go into... Um, uh, aquariums these days and you can see a silicanth today. And so uh, it was preserved immediately in that, uh, that sedimentary layer and was preserved for us. So it sort of undermines the development or the connection between various um, species as, uh, as presented uh, by evolutionists. However, uh, this is really supporting evidence of of the fact that a flood happened. <clears throat> okay, so that's maybe life forms, but what about uh, some, some other things like rock forms? And uh, there's been much debate about uh, the, you know, the development of big uh, geological structures like, uh, like the um, Grand Canyon in America, you know, how many millions of years it took to, uh, to develop and that kind of thing. Well, people, people came to the point um, that actually stratification of what's called sedimentary rock is something that can happen over a very short period of time. And that um, particular ph phenomena is, is, uh, is seen in many, many geological um, points. So sedimentary rock, it covers around about a three, three quarters of the Earth's surface, including uh, the tops of mountains. 
and it's typically eroded from one location or, or maybe several locations, then transported and deposited. So this kind of movement of large volumes of sand, mud and rock uh, develops sedimentary rock. Some of our most popular and interesting rocks in Australia, like uh, Uluru and, uh, and the Olgas next door to it, are actually sedimentary rocks. And, uh, and of course, they, uh, they are formed by the movement of soil uh, and, and then great pressure applied to it, which creates uh, this interesting um, geological phenomenon called stratification. Stratification really is just the layering of, uh, of different soils, as uh, evidenced in that little uh, laboratory experiment there, um, where where different coloured layer soils or different types of uh, rock are developed and, of course, present a multi-layered um, sort of approach. So sedimentary rock is unique to the Earth's surface. And what they found by, uh, by these uh, certain experiments and certain other events that have happened in the world is that stratification actually does not require millions of years to occur. Stratification, the layers in rock formation, can occur in a very short time. Soils of differing density, uh, particle size, um, different coarseness, different uh, grain size, that is, it is uh, settles into a slurry and, of course, forms a different layer. And that, uh, that is studied in great depth by geologists around the world. <clears throat> Some examples of that in uh, 1980, maybe a bit uh, older than most of us, or some of us here, um, the, um, the forms that came out because of the Mount uh, St Helens eruption. More recently, for instance, you might have seen uh, down in this picture here some pictures of, as the volcano in Hawaii has erupted and relayered the earth with uh, a very, very specific and very catastrophic um, layer of very, very hot lava. And, of course, that then cools and another layer comes over the top. So stratification, this method of layering of sedimentary rock in its various forms um, that form either near or the Earth's surface, is really by the accumulation and compaction of uh, naturally adhesing materials together, uh, which then captures uh, you know, fossils and those kind of things in it. Uh, if you're interested in um, stratification, you can actually visit the Flinders and there's several things up there. I don't have any pictures here. Um, but uh, there is lots of elements of that happening uh, in some very interesting um, areas around the Pitchy Ritchy Pass, if you're interested. <coughs> Another um, point of evidence is this unusual phrase called polystrate fossils. Now, when this stratification happens, when this layering happens... Uh, as, as we see here, this is actually a replica of an existing one. The different colours, the different shapes, the different forms of that layering um, was, was originally seemed to be a, a result of many millions of years. And, of course, that would be the case if it wasn't for the tr fact that through the middle of it, of these multiple layers, a tree was growing. So this stratification was happening basically in the lifetime of a tree, maybe at the very best or very longest time it's possible for for that to happen would be maybe a thousand years, the, the very oldest of trees. So polystrate fossils, that is fossils that are growing across multiple layers of stratas is an interesting uh, uh, proof, I believe, of a rapid um, and an immediate uh, layering of, um, uh, of sedimentary material that is cause this, um, this fossilisation to happen. So it's a single organism, as we say there, such as a tree trunk, that extends through. And in actual fact, they found various animals that were uh, captured in these various layers uh, and still in good tact uh, through that. Um, and also, we notice that the fossils have a uniform condition through the, uh, through the top to the bottom. So if that were to be millions of years, uh, the tree has has maintained its regular shape for a very, very long point in time. In actual fact, these things point to a very rapid layering of the Earth's surface um, that uh, would in undoubtedly have been caused by the flood and some 
models have been created, some video models that I weren't, I'm not able to project here this evening, but are available on YouTube of, of what that would have looked like with the rupture of the Earth's surface, the movement of great volumes of water, the transport of great uh, volumes of sand and, and other materials into, uh, into what uh, now had becomes the fossil record. So I think the fossil record actually becomes supporting evidence outside of the Bible um, to the actual catastrophe of the flood that happened, we know, within the space of, uh, you know, just over a year. So what about that? Um, we've seen uh, some evidence outside of the Bible from uh, different cultures of, of that uh, kind of uh, event happening. But really, what does it mean? As far as Bible students go today, why would we want to prove that this... Um, this event and this uh, series of um, records in the scripture of, are of any value to myself. Well, it really presents as a, what we might call a present day warning. Um, the flood is a tragic historic event where the, uh, the accumulation of both human and animal life would destroy completely off the face of the earth. And it is used by Jesus Christ and others, in this case, Jude, the prophet in the New Testament, sorry, Jude, the writer of the book in the New Testament, talks about the prophet Enoch, who happened to be Noah's great-great-great-grandfather, uh, who warned his world of a time to come. Time to come, And he said to that world, uh, as recorded by Jude, that they should stop their ungodly behaviour and, and listen to the God of that had created the heavens and the earth, otherwise they would be caught up in that catastrophe. And of course, we know from Genesis chapter 6, 7 and 8 that, that a mere eight people listened. And we're going to refer that uh, a little bit later. It was characterised by a generation that had mocking cynicism of God's teaching and the prophecies contained in the, script, in, in, in the, the word of truth. A generation that were willfully ignorant of historical facts of the flood being prepared to receive the judgments associated with the, the very second coming that it mocked. And of course, that's a chilling warning because as Enoch and as Peter says, that they were warnings for that generation. And so we appeal to you to look to the Bible because we issue the same warning and Jesus Christ issues that warning for us today. So although a tragedy happened, it does not mean that you have to be caught up in that tragedy. And our appeal to you this evening is to stop and listen um, to, to the warning that is being presented. It was a generation that was not just characterised by violent crime and moral co corruption. It was a generation, as Luke 17 says, and apologies that that's not that clear, I'll, we'll turn to that, maybe in Luke chapter 17, verse 26 in our Bibles, because here was a lackadaisical, a lazy, and an uninterested generation who refused to listen to the warning that was um, given them by both Jesus Christ and the others there. So Luke chapter 17, verse 26 to 28, is an occasion where the Lord Jesus Christ is standing with his disciples and is trying to convince them of an impending judgment by the Roman army on, on their nation of Jerusalem. And of course, the Jews believed that it would stand and last forever. And he says to them in Luke 17, verse 26, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And that description is, has a sense of finality about it, doesn't it? It's as though they believed that things would keep going until, as Genesis records, the angel of God closed the door on Noah and the opportunity to respond to the warning was then gone. And the flood came and destroyed them all. So here is Jesus Christ re referencing Noah's flood and trying to warn another generation because of the calamity that happened. Likewise also, he goes on to say, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted and they built it. It's all active trading activity, isn't it? And of course, the same day that Lot 
walk, um, the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. You see, God makes an attempt to warn people of the calamity to come. And as Bible believers, we believe there is another calamity coming to this earth prior to the Lord Jesus Christ returning that will be equivalent, as the Lord says, to his days. Ah, there we go. That's how we make it work. Sorry about that. But is it just calamity? Well, we suggest that it actually is, uh, there is a message of hope here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and so we read, because they formerly did not obey. This is First Peter 3 uh, from the uh, English Standard Version. Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited, and we might add in brackets there, for 120 years in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. And he goes on to add, he says, baptism, which corresponds to this now, saves you not as the removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our appeal to you, as Peter's is this evening, ladies and gentlemen, is that you have an opportunity to avoid the calamity that was brought about if you are prepared to accept the Genesis record. <clears throat> In conclusion, what have we learnt this evening? The flood and Noah's Ark, the pre-flood world was destroyed. Sometimes uh, people use the word antediluvian. That means prior to the flood. Biblically, internally, it's used by Jesus Christ as a very strong warning of the events both at AD 70 and of our own day, which you can ask us about afterwards and we will go into more detail about. But the important point is it's a warning of future events. Don't be fooled or lulled into thinking that it will not happen again. There is the... <clears throat> external evidence uh, for the flood in some of the fossils. We talked about polystrate fossils that, that went between layers of strata that had been placed immediately on the earth by a calamity of the flood proportions. There was the um, uh, silicanths, the, the fish that were thought to be extinct many millions of years ago, actually found to be uh, consistently um, living today as, as proof of their, uh, their permanency in that, uh, in that pre preservation mecha mechanism. Uh, we looked at the uh, formation of a uh, sedimentary and the issues around stratification. We looked at uh, the warning by Jesus Christ. It's a warning for today, and we seek uh, your interest in, in further pursuing uh, the warning message of the Bible, because Jesus Christ was incredibly serious when he talked to his disciples about that and we seek to implore you to keep studying your Bible to take the message of Genesis 6 seriously and the warning that came from Jesus Christ around that. Thank you.